All right, so um, welcome everyone to our uh, Royal Geographical Society with um, IBG um, webinar about GI science. Uh, my name is Andrea Balator from uh, Birkbeck University of London, and it's um, my pleasure today to host um, Sarah Battersby, who has been working um, for Tableau um, as, a, as a researcher in, uh, in GI science uh, for several years and after um, a PhD in, um, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where she worked um, in, uh, at the intersection of cognitive uh, science and um, cartography. And it's very interesting to see that her career um, has brought her to uh, continue to work on that, um, on that area, but in the uh, in a industry, in an industry setting. And I'm particularly pleased about this because we always try to balance um, academics and, um, and people doing really interesting uh, things in industry. So, um, as usual, um, if you have questions, you can use the chat and uh, we'll try to, uh, so if you have questions um, about, about uh, Sarah's work, uh, you can wait for the end of the presentation, uh, but we'll try to, um, to address all, all your questions in the chat. And without further ado, uh, let's welcome um, Sarah to our webinar and the floor is yours. We can't have an applause, Thanks. but yeah. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just imagine it. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, so, you know, as mentioned, you know, my name's Sarah Battersby, and I'm on the Tableau research team, and I like to think about maps. Um, so, more specifically, I like to think about how people think about maps, and since I've been at Tableau, which has been about seven years now, um, I've focused my energy on some of the challenges of mapping in a self-service analytics world. Um, just for a little context, before I was at Tableau, uh, I worked at a university, so I was I was a professor doing all of the the normal research things and teaching classes, and I ended up using some of the Tableau software in one of my advanced cartography classes to talk about dashboards, and I got really interested in how it worked and how it was making mapping available to the masses, I guess you could say, um, and I ended up doing a visiting expert position over a summer at Tableau and was really excited about this idea of how we can help analytics companies think more carefully about the people who are trying to use their software. And from my perspective, you know, specifically, how we can think about the problem, of how spatial data work, how spatial technology works, and the fact that people have a lot of crazy ways of thinking about the world and that, you know, for self-service spatial analytics, we need to think pretty carefully about how we magically represent and analyze data in digital form. So today, um, in my talk, I'm gonna tell some stories about some of the interesting challenges that I've encountered along the way. And I'm gonna go ahead and just give the spoiler of the talk. I know this is like, you know, turn off, turn off your, your off if you don't want the spoiler here. Um, but I don't think there are really great automated solutions for many of the challenges that we face. But I think there are really great opportunities for software and application developers, for educators, for researchers, and I think everyone interested in the GI science field to think about how we can collectively help create a more spatially aware society and to help kind of the broader population develop a critical eye for spotting problems and solutions. In so I'm going to start with just a bit of framing. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, I like to think about how people think about maps. And there are some key and I think pretty large issues. Um, first thing is technology. We have great technology tools for working with spatial data and we're gonna use them. Yeah, you know, whether you're talking about a GIS or self-service analytics, you know, they're great tools to use. Um, today, I'm just gonna talk about a subset of these technologies, which is the self-service analytics side of things. And these are technologies that have more limited capabilities, but generally easier options to make the analysis accessible. And when we make the analysis accessible, we encounter our second problem area, and that is people. Uh, so people are using these technologies, and people have spatial questions. And you know, there are a lot of technology options to help people ask and answer their spatial questions to unlock the power of their data. Then we get this intersection of the two. And this is the super crazy fact that people want to actually use technology to make sense of the world. And that 
people have expectations that the technology works the way that we think about space and that it's going to be right. So as a bonus challenge on this, um, of the way people typically think about space, it can be a little bit weird and isn't necessarily in line with the way that the technology is designed to represent space. So let's just start with the technology itself. Um, yeah, you know, we've been talking about the democratization of cartographic and geographic information science for a long time. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I think, yeah, I think I first became aware of this conversation with Joel Morrison's work, and you know, probably like the mid to late '90s. Um, and these discussions of democratization of cartography and GIS, they were really kind of from center in a lot of my undergraduate work when I was working with what I now think of as the ancient and Atari looking but super powerful command line arc info but also with ArcView you know Esri's at the time you know this was like 1996 or something Esri's you know super fancy GUI GIS variant that had more limited functionality but was a lot easier to use for you know just a lot of basic mapping tasks so even in those days um, you know undergraduate, I was hearing stories about whether the fancy ArcView GUI, which, you know, as you can see, was probably only fancy for the era, um, you know, whether it was going to make it so that anybody could do complex mapping, and that by doing this, maybe we were opening the door for all of these people who could just all of a sudden make maps real quickly to miss the subtle nuances required for doing accurate work with spatial data. And by that, you know, I mean, the sort of, you know, accuracy type stuff that took a billion reads through the ARC Info command line reference books. And if you've never used ARC Info command line, if that was you know, well before your time, there was a wall, like full like wall of all of these binders of command line references in our GIS lab. And it was just insane to try and find anything. At least I felt like it was insane to find anything. So you'd have to go back and try and remember like all of the exact commands to type in in the right order to walk through the processing and analysis for a specific task. So by not having to do that, we're making things just too easy for people and people were going to do bad things. So the, these are just some old examples of technology and kind of a reflection of how long we've been debating this challenge of democratizing cartography. And I think it's a reflection of the fact that the bigger picture of the type of problems that I'm going to talk about today are not specific to the self-service analytics world. They occur across the world of spatial technologies and probably a lot of visualization technologies as a whole. In the more recent era, uh, we've seen a proliferation of mapping tools, um, you know, from the ones that I might describe as more specialist focused, like the varied spatial packages that have been developed for R and for Python, where, you know, the typical audience is probably more people with domain and software expertise that is not specifically geographic, but that requires some analysis of spatial data. And then we go to the more modern GUI heavy tools, such as you know, Esri's ArcGIS Online and the derivative products, the offerings from Cardo, from Mapbox, and of course, um, from Tableau, where I am. And these tools are designed to cater to both spatial experts and to non-experts. People who have domain expertise that is non-spatial but have spatial questions, and people with advanced degrees in mapping who just wake up wanting to tackle some fun new mapping problems. I mean, for context um, on that, you know, I have a couple degrees in uh, mapping related fields and I wake up every morning just ready to try and bend these software to my, my will and do some fun mapping things. So this is the space that I find particularly interesting. Um, there's some really intense spatial technology under the hood trying to make sure that you know, anybody can ask and answer spatial questions easily. But there are also decisions that have to be made on the engineering side behind the scenes about what exactly um, what, what functionality exactly is needed and how complex the analytics can really be. Because it needs to be easy, it needs to be straightforward, and it needs to be really fast. Um, a term that I've heard thrown around is that, you know, we need to allow people to answer questions at the speed of thought. So in general, um, from my work with GIS over the years and from working with a lot of spatial data users, it's pretty clear, um, to me at least, that a majority of the spatial questions that people have require a limited set of functionality. 
And when I say, you know, majority of spatial questions that people have, I'm talking about kind of the broad set of everybody, not like the majority of questions that people who are working on PhDs and GI science have. Um, it's kind of a different, different category. Um, but I would bet that, you know, even if you thought about your own analytics work, most of what you do probably uses a fairly small portion of the functionality of your GIS of choice. So now think about the basic questions that you can imagine for the, you know, the quote unquote average person. Things like overlay, proximity calculations, buffers, intersections. And when you put those together in various combinations, you can do a whole lot with this small set of functionality. Okay, am I reconnected? I don't know what happened. I have no yeah, idea. all of a sudden, everybody just started like the little circles around everybody's name that everybody was reconnecting. So I can hear hopefully you it's all and, back. Yeah, the slides See are the back. Slides? So, sorry about that. I have no idea what happened, but it seems to be okay now. Well, I'm assuming most of the last slide was clear, but hand waving summarization. Technology, it's crazy. Oh my gosh. So now we've got the people side of the process. And I can summarize this as, oh my gosh, people, it's crazy. Um, and I think this is where things get really tricky. Um, no matter how great technology may be, how accurate it is, um, we have to face the challenge that people are using the technology. And the big challenge as I see it is that we're all really great sensors of the world. We have this amazing knowledge of the world around us. Um, the parts we interact with on a daily base, basis walking around, as well as the parts of the world that we've never seen before. We've read about them, we've seen pictures. Um, and the world is this super great three-dimensional, immensely detailed wonder that we've got a good kind of general intuitive understanding of how it works. And it turns out that spatial technology doesn't always work in the way that we make sense of the world. And the technology requires the data to be digitized, which requires simplification. We flatten the world with map projections. We do analyses that may or may not align with how you conceptualize space. Uh, what I mean by this is that you know, with people, we have to deal with the fact that not only do technologies require simplification of the world, people also simplify the world to make sense of it. And this includes the fact that our amazingly detailed knowledge of the world is often quite fuzzy. Um, you know, for instance, let's think quickly about how we would even consider something like a geographic region. I mean, we all have ways that we make sense of the world and categorize locations. And some of my favorite examples of kind of the weirdness of this um, are things like how would you define regions like Northern California and Southern California? Uh, this example here is from some of Dan Montello's cognitive region work, um, you know, where they had people you know, draw the line between Northern Southern California, where is the boundary between these regions? Or perhaps if you think about the boundary of downtown or the city center in which you grew up, I mean, you could probably draw a map of these rough borders, but they probably wouldn't match up exactly with anyone else's or with the border that might be stored in the analytics tool that you're using, which we'll talk about in a second. So in general, you know, the point here is that people think about space in both very concrete and very fuzzy ways. And internally, we make peace with this, but spatial technologies aren't that great with the fact that we have these fuzzy understandings of location. Um, just to throw a little bit of reference in here, if you want uh, a neat paper to read to think about you know, some of the, the older work on kind of these principles of how weird people are when they think about space, uh, one of the papers that I come back to over and over again is this one by Max Egenhofer and David Mark from the early 90s. And they have this principle in their naive geography paper, and it's resonated with for a long time, and that's that maps are more real than experience. In general, we trust the map, but we also have to deal with the fact that, you know, there are these other challenges of na naive geography, and that people just have funny ways of making sense of how the world works. And I'm not going to go into a lot of specific details on the oddities that, that Egenhofer and Mark point out, but I'd highly recommend it as a nice primer on just weird ways people think about space if you want to dig in a little bit farther. And it's one of 
favorite papers. So I, I, I try and throw this out to people all the time because it's super accessible and just a really interesting way of getting into people are weird. So when you put together people and maps and thinking about their challenges, we start by making peace with this key fact about all maps. And that is that they're all wrong. Um, every map is going to be wrong in some way. And the wrongness can be really spectacular and awesome at times. I mean, at least if you like thinking about the fact that geography is really weird. But maps are also still super useful in their wrongness, and they help us understand the world around us. So let's talk about those challenges. I'm going to start with a problem that I like to call the floating home crime spree issues of Seattle. Um, if you haven't been to Seattle, or even if you have visited, um, you may not know that we have quite a few houseboats or floating homes, as I believe the realtors like to call them. And you know, those are on the lakes within the city. And you know, let's say you wanted to buy a house in Seattle and you wanted to find something, you know, information about like crime and patterns in different neighborhoods. Um, so you find a nice data set of crime and you start to dig in and explore. And this is a common request for this type of self-service analytics tool. I have a table of data. I know there's something spatial in it. Um, it's got latitude and longitude. How can I analyze it? And yeah, you know, the whole point of self-service analytics is you know you can just drop that into the software. You can drop your data onto the map. You know, no problem. Let's start seeing patterns. Let's start understanding what's going on in the world around us. Uh, but that doesn't always work the way that you expect. So I love this data set for helping people start to explore spatial patterns because it gets to the fundamentals of spatial data, the point. If your points are off, pretty much everything is off because lines and polygons are all based on points. You know, any derivative calculations you get to are, are a problem. But people think about points as being this very exact thing. There are some challenges because people tend to have this concept of latitude and longitude as an exact thing without necessarily thinking about the fact that it's really exact, exact when you know the shape of the Earth for which the angular measurements were taken. So it turns out that latitude and longitude isn't just latitude and longitude, and people have a really hard time with this, um, especially when you're working with something like a text file, which doesn't come with nice, helpful spatial reference details. And this is exactly what self-service analytic tool, analytics tools were designed to do, let you take just any data, and let's start seeing those spatial patterns. So we add the data to our workbook, we drop latitude and longitude onto the map, and you know, here we go. What kind of patterns do we get? You know, Seattle crime, we have a lot of houseboats. Um, turns out there are a lot of crimes out on those houseboats. And you can see with the, the red arrow here, you can see all of these crime dot locations from the police data set out on the docks. And so this leads to a lot of fascinating conversations. When I use this demo data set, we talk about, well, I mean, how do people get out there? I thought there were locked gates. Are people like bringing their boat in and breaking into the houses? Um, you know, we really go all sorts of crazy places. But it turns out that this pattern is completely fake. Um, and, but how would you know that if you're in data exploration mode? Um, well, if you know me and the kind of data sets that I make, you might expect it because you might know that I like to make really bad data for people to play with. Um, but if you're just an average user and like, hey, I've got this data set, you might know that not, not think about the fact that there's something weird here. And that means to me it's just really critical that you have to ask what's unexpected in your data and dig a bit deeper to see if there's really a true pattern or if it's just a strange artifact. So whenever you're working with spatial data, you need to know a bit about your data origins and the assumptions of the tool that you're using um, and what it makes about your data, especially when you're working with something like these super exact latitude and longitude. Um, it turns out this particular set of data was using the North American datum of 1927, um, which is not really what the Seattle police data uses. They do use, um, I think, the more modern datum. I just kind of cheated and made this data set because it was really a fun example to um, talk with folks at work and with, with customers and everybody about why latitude and longitude is just crazy weird. So any mapping tool that lets you just use latitude and longitude and drop it straight on is going to have to make an assumption about the data. Tableau, for instance, assumes that it's using the World Geodetic Survey of 1984. And what happens when you take these angular measurements from a different datum and just assume that they're all the same? You might get um, what I call the dreaded datum shift. And you end up thinking there's a huge houseboat crime spree because all of those points have been shifted when you use a different datum. Um, just as a fun Tableau fact, if you were curious, um, we have a bike to work team for our map 
team and we are called the datum shifters. Uh, just kind of random map joke. So what should the data really look like? Um, it should look like the image on the left, where the latitude and longitude values are correctly defined using the WGS84 datum, versus the one on the right, where we've got latitude and longitude using NAD27. But take a step back now and think about the map creator and the map reader. What is it that they see in this example? All they know is, I have a column of latitude and longitude, and I want to put it on the map. Are they thinking about, oh, these are just angular measurements, and I need to know about the, the datum that was used to create these? No, they downloaded the data from an open data portal. They put it in, you know, they had it in a CSV or a text table, and they just want to map it. So this is a challenge that comes up pretty regularly. Um, so now let's go to some other levels of complexity, because it isn't just about points we deal with as like these raw locations. The points connect to form lines and polygons. They're used for all sorts of analyses. We might also want to do some uh, processing on these. We might want to aggregate them to understand where they are relative to other things like county, states, country borders, or even arbitrary geographies like hexagonal bins. So let's press on and, and see some of those other challenges that crop up. I'll start with some of the challenges of aggregation. So this is a really common request with point data sets. And that while it's nice to see the points by themselves on the map, we often want to know something more about the overall distribution of data. And the raw points don't always make the patterns clear. So we aggregate. And sometimes this is with regular shapes like hexagons or squares, where our mapping polygons are, at least in theory, representing the same size and shape region on the map. So for instance, we might see visualizations like Kirk Goldsberry's Grantland um, visualizations on the left that use hex bins for where basketball players are taking shots. Or on the right, um, these are taxi cab pickup locations in Manhattan in New York City. And here there's so much data, you can't make any sense out of it until you aggregate it. So we put it in the hexagonal bins and we can start to see you know, where there are more or less pickups. So this seems like a really simple request. And it's one that I hear a lot. Um, but unfortunately with geospatial data, you know, again, we're dealing with spherical coordinates and latitude and longitude, which introduces a lot of challenges that people don't often, often think about, especially with large geographic areas. So in most mapping tools with an online component, the base map tends to be Web Mercator. So we'll focus the discussion there. Um, and my guess is, you know, probably at least a few of you have had this little like, kind of uncontrollable tick when I mentioned Mercator, because I think at some point in everyone's geographic career, they develop this just like, oh my gosh, Mercator. Uh. Uh, I think we're trained to hate it on some level, but there are some useful reasons why we, why we do use that. But it does wreak havoc on some of the analytics. Let's look at our nice regular spatial bins on that base map. Um, you know, the whole point of things like hex bins are to have a level playing field for our data. I can compare location one and location two and get some absolute measure of how they differ. This actually um, kind of false. You know, we've got these nice regular hexagonal bins right here at global scale, and I'm color coding them to show a count of a number of points from a random point data set that I generated that fall inside them. You know, I just added my lat longs. I dropped them on the map, I analyzed my data, I put them in hex bins, it's great. Um, spatial problem of mapping distribution has been solved. And you know, we can see this very clear pattern that the data is heavier around the equator and lighter as we get close to the poles. Except for the fact that that isn't true. Um, the bins only look like they're the same size on the map. And that is a really hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. Um, because they look the same on the map and the map is more real than reality. Um, turns out, in reality, as you get closer to the poles, due to the distortion in Web Mercator, the bins are actually covering a smaller and smaller ground area, and that smaller geographic area tends to capture fewer points. And while this is conceptually understood by a lot of people, I mean, I've done some work in the past that looked at, you know, people could recognize uh, that a projection was distorted, they could tell me something about the patterns, particularly for Mercator, that, oh, uh, areas are exaggerated up closer to the poles, but they really could not compensate for that. And if I showed them a data set like this, they're just like, oh, clearly the, um, the distribution is heavier around the equator, not thinking about the fact that those bins really are not equivalent. If we're actually using bins that were the same approximate size on the sphere, we'd see something that looks more like this example on the right. And these are using something called um, icosahedral Snyder equal area bins. It's a data set from Kevin Saar. And these bins are generated 
to be you know, approximately the same ground area. But when we put them onto a Mercator projection or a web Mercator projection, you know, they're, each of the bins is going to represent the same approximate ground area, which means that they're going to look larger as they get closer to the poles. And what we see is a very different pattern with analyzing this data set. So the map on the left and the map on the right are exactly the same point distribution. And what we see is with the bins that are approximately the same, um, they all have approximately the same number of points inside them. So even though you know, you've got this nice hexagonal grid that looks super perfect and regular on your web Mercator map, and just because you're using these super hip and edgy and cool map um, hexagons look great on Twitter, you're probably getting an inaccurate assessment of what the pattern is of your data and how it changes over space. And you know, yes, you, you can do this with your map in a self-service analytic tool. Uh, we will make it easy for you, uh, but you probably really shouldn't be making any comparisons between locations. Um, if just by chance you want to know more about the challenges of spatial binning, um, I can refer you to a paper I wrote with um, Mike Finn and Dan Streety. Um, Dan's actually one of our principal software engineers at Tableau and often a partner in crime of mine. We talk about the bad things that people would do with their data. Um, our paper was called Shapes on a Plane, uh, which is probably the best title of any paper that I've ever written and the only one for which I have um, created a logo. Uh, Unfortunately, we were turned down for the movie deal on our adaptation. I guess um, snakes with hexagons on planes was not, not exciting to Hollywood. Anyway, let's just carry this a bit further um, because it isn't just hex bins that have aggregation problems. And we see this on heat maps as well. And so I would describe heat maps as being totally hot um, and totally requested all the time and something that people really like to use as a common technique for understanding distributions of their data. But just like hex bins, they're generally pretty questionable in accuracy. So people love heat maps and there's this, this huge challenge with implementing them in a self-service analytics world. So as I noted before, you know, we tend to work in the web Mercator environment. So how would you go about calculating something like point density? You've got a choice. You're either going to calculate screen coordinates or you're calculate in spherical coordinates. So let's look at what happens with screen coordinates and the validity of comparisons. So I've got this data set here. This is a nice cluster of points located near the equator. And here is exactly the same data set that I just rotated on the sphere up to, to being close to Greenland. And we go from the heat map showing a single really nice, very clear hot spot to showing these five individual kind of dis first hot spots. And let's just take a look at them on the same map. Um, what, what is the valid assessment that you can make of this pattern? You know, if, if the intent was to be able to make comparisons between different locations on the map, you know, what we see here is that, you know, clearly there's this large cluster near South America and there's some distributed smaller clusters farther north. But that's not really the pattern at all. It's exactly the same distribution. So in you know enough about the way that Mercator distorts area and you can compensate that for your for that in your mind which most people even people like with you know trained geographers generally cannot do very well um, you've got to think about you know what are the other options I mean I would say the option is let's just not do this um, but the other thing you could think is well why don't you just calculate density and spherical coordinates um, well if you do that think about what happens to that hot spot now Greenland. It is like the gigantic hot spot of doom. You have this gigantic red, like glowing hot spot orb that is now like 16 times larger than it is at the equator. Um, that's just kind of crazy. So it's not really a good option. So should we just not let people do this? I mean, this becomes a pretty intense debate. Um, you know, how do you warn people? Will they listen? Do you just stop someone from doing anything that you might be a bad idea. Well, that means that we need to know the user intent, how they're going to use the map, what is their data. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing that in a, a self-service analytics world, it becomes a really huge issue because we need to make the analytics accessible 
Um, and there are probably good reasons that people might want to use heat maps on data sets that are dispersed that don't involve making comparisons between different locations. You know, we can't just say, oh, you, know, you can't make that heat map above you know, 40 degrees north. I mean, that's not a, really an acceptable answer. So I would say this is the sort of thing that we, we need like a beer or two and to talk about um, after the talk. Uh, so when I see you all non-virtually, we can, we can have that conversation because there's probably no good solution inside the technology. But maybe what we really want to know about, um, you know, isn't you know, these, these aggregated distributions like um, you know, heat maps and hex spins, but we want to know something about our data with respect to regions that we care about. And then we get to that question of what is the border of those regions. And so it's, you know, it isn't a concept the average person thinks, I think, a whole lot about in their spatial analysis. People just want to know about the stuff that is here. And they have a conceptual understanding of what this, this thing here means, whether it's a postal code, a fuzzy definition of downtown, a country boundary, or something else. And the way this typically happens in analytics is that you know, do some Googling. They download a set of geographic boundaries. And there's some expectation that they're right. And so, you know, what right is with respect to spatial boundaries is then going to be debatable. Um, you know, for instance, there's the, the classic paper on how long is the coast of Britain. You can tell, you know, the, the fractal dimensionality of coastlines. Um, so, so we've got that whatever data set you've just downloaded is your source of truth, but the exact border in that source of truth may not actually match up with your knowledge of the boundaries of that region in the real world that you're experiencing every day. So here's an example I deal with fairly regularly. Um, your self-service analytics tools provide some amount of spatial data, and we want to make things easy for you um, because it takes a long time to source data, clean it, stitch it together. You know, self-service analytics, it's all about making things easy. So we provide some data, and generally we do this at a global scale, but data can be really large and complicated, and we have to have this balance between detail that's enough for most projects without taking too much storage space or adding unnecessary complexity. Yeah, I know, you know, there's automated generalization that we can do, but, you know, if you have to have a desktop installer, you have to be able to work offline, you know, no one looks fondly on our saying, you know, we've got this terabyte of really amazingly detailed spatial data, we'll just put that on your laptop for you. Yeah, so, so we simplify the data to have this kind of reasonable mix of accuracy and size. So I'll just use county border data set um, from the U.S. as an example. You know, at the U.S. scale, these look totally fine. If we zoom in and look at the boundaries for, this is counties in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, um, you know, for context, I've added some tiny yellow text to show where San Francisco is. Um, the boundaries look a bit chunkier, but it's probably still reasonable enough detail when you're just doing a bit of exploring in the local area with the thematic data. Now, if we compare it just directly to the base map, which is based on vector tiles that do have some built-in generalization based on level of zoom, because they're all pre-created in advance, and it's just vector data that's, that's coming to you um, in the base map. At this even more local scale, the data may not look quite as clean, and we're even seeing big chunks of cities cut off. So just for a bit more context, um, I put an arrow pointing to um, a town called Sausalito. Uh, here, even a good bit of land in the town and even the highway running through it are now considered outside of the county boundary. From a cartographic perspective, um, this presents a number of problems and causes some confusion. You know, people question the accuracy of the data, which is you know, rightful because it's been significantly simplified. And they lament the aesthetics of the boundary mismatch with the base map. Um, you know, people get kind of confused over why aren't these things just the same. So de depending on the type of self-service analytic system you're working with, you know, this may or may not be a problem. I mean, for fully cloud-based systems where all data is delivered on the fly as part of the service, um, you know, the generalization and simplification can keep things in sync. But as I mentioned before, you know, if you have to work in an offline situation, um, you know, you're not always connected, you're on an airplane. I mean, I do a lot of mapping on airplanes. You need to have local storage, which means that you're probably going to have these simplified polygons. And so it's, yeah, you know, there, there is just this mismatch that confuses people cartographically, but it isn't just a cartographic problem. I, you know, I want to get back to some of those derivative analytics that people do. 
And you know how when we think about how polygon data sets work for analytics, you know there's this expectation that they're right, and that while the computer is probably calculating all of the spatial relationships right, the world is weird enough that the results don't match human expectations. So this is one of my favorite just simple problems. What country is a house in? Um, in the real world, we have three-dimensional structures in three-dimensional regions. In the map world, we probably have points and we have polygons. Points are zero-dimensional, polygons are two-dimensional, and unless those polygon boundaries overlap, the point will fall in no more than one polygon. The problem is solved. Houses, for instance, cannot be in two countries. Um, but the world is messy, you know, as these examples point out. Um, these are just a few that I found, you know, one from the U.S.-Canada border and one from the Belgium-Netherlands border, where you have these three-dimensional houses that fall in three-dimensional countries and happen to fall in multiple ones. Um, and I particularly like that the example on the right notes that this is, quote-unquote, the only house in the world that is part of two countries. If you do a Google search on the problem, you'll actually find quite a few, because geography in the real world is so weird and it doesn't necessarily line up with the way that we think about the data as it's been simplified. So just to see, you know, a problem that happens all the time, you know, to see this in context, um, you know, the analysis for like a point in polygon, where does it fall, is generally right. It's, you know, it's just an algorithm. But when the polygons have been generalized um, or the points have been simplified or real world has been simplified into points, we have this problem where points may fall inside the, you know, quote unquote, wrong polygon. You know, it's a great combination of the accuracy of the latitude and longitude and the point locations and the level of detail and precision on the polygon data. And the fact that all geographic data is just a representation of the world and that representation doesn't necessarily match with how the data is modeled for analysis. You know, this example here is two different data sets from the US Census. Um, they come in lots of different resolutions. So here's a 1 to 500,000, and here's a 1 to 20, 20 million um, data set. And there's a point location marked with a red arrow. And with one of those data sets, that point is in the polygon. With the other data set, it is not in the polygon. This is kind of a weird mismatch that people don't expect. Um, you have to do a lot of explaining to people why mapping software isn't wrong when it gives you something like the postal code for your address, and that doesn't match up with what you know your own postal code is. I've talked with people who have two postal codes for their homes. I've talked with people who can never find their location on Google Maps. Um, these are just problems with when you represent the real world and simplify it into map world. So I've looked at um, you know, a few issues related to the general question of where it is, how it's distributed, but a large number of spatial questions also revolve around these questions of how far away and how locations are connected. And in a projected world, these are far from straightforward. Um, you know, some of my favorite that I deal with, uh, people disagreeing with the assessment of shortest path between locations. Um, you know, for instance, in this example, um, you know, I've got two different maps here. And they show paths connecting locations. And first off, these are not the shortest path. But people will be like, I drew a straight line between these. It's the shortest path. And not only does it not look like what I expect, because I want it to be that kind of curvy line, um, but it goes the wrong way. And I love that second part. It goes the wrong way around the Earth. Um, because clearly this is not the shortest path when it disconnects and goes around the periphery and then comes back on the other side of the map. This is a really fascinating problem to me um, because we have multiple misconceptions happening. You know, what is shortest path? True shortest path, you need a great circle or a great elliptical. It's not going to be a straight line on the map, which it's actually built into Tableau, so it's easy to fix that problem with these maps. You can do the calculation, get a, a great, great elliptic arc. Um, but the it's going the wrong way misconception is really harder to explain. And often it's just this aesthetic, I, but I want the line to go the other way because it looks better on my map, so make that the shortest path. And it turns out that I don't have control over um, the shape of the Earth or shortest paths on the Earth. But I do occasionally um, teach people how to put intermediate points and force the shortest path to go other ways, which I feel a little bit sketchy about. 
So just, just to, to clarify, I mean, the, the neat thing I think we're doing in Tableau is that we make it super easy for people to get real distances, real directions, real shortest paths on the map. Um, because this is something I think is important for self-service analytics tools. Um, you shouldn't have to know the math to do this. If you want the shortest path, we should give it to you. And I'll note, this isn't how spatial analytics tools work, um, particularly when you get into using a full-fledged GIS, because many tools require you to manually adjust your data or your view, or to pick a special calculation to perform these measurements. And from a self-service analytics perspective, this is not a burden you should place on users. Um, but it also means that we've got a huge responsibility to educate people about why things are right, even though they may look wrong. Um, now just another paper reference, if you're curious, on some work in this area. Um, I think that, that one of the interesting studies that, that I've encountered is Anderson and Leinhardt's 2002 work on um, how people understand projections, and they focused on being able to draw shortest paths. And conceptually, people often understand that things like the curved line is the right path, but they don't really know how to make that other than the line should be curved. Which brings up another kind of strange little problem that comes up in dealing with artifacts of map projections. You know, most web-based tools are using Web Mercator, and it's not defined above approximately 85 degrees north and south. So if you have something like a shortest path that crosses over the poles, you don't see that as a curve anymore. It becomes a flat line. So now your nice, it should be a curvy path looks weird. So periodically people reach out to me to discuss why the map is wrong, because it always starts out with that. Let me tell you why your map is wrong. And then we get into the, you know, well, let me tell you why spatial data is weird. And we go from there. So an example that, that I really like, some of our power users have then gotten creative with graphics to deal with the limitations, um, generally after they hassle me about why the maps are wrong. So for instance, this, this is just a quick example from one of our Zen masters um, named Anya Ahern. She was creating a scene from the old movie War Games, and she encountered the straight line at the top of the map problem in Tableau. So she just made it work graphically. Um, I would say, you know, you can always do some cool trickery to make maps look however you want, but these aren't really the actual paths anymore, but I would bet that more people would like this map than like the map with the straight line, because it has that curvy line that is what they quote unquote expect. Um, and just as kind of a fun example, um, she animated it to get map slinky, and let me see if I can get this to play. I'll just show you this just because it's it's kind of like mind bending to watch this like weird map slinky happening. Anyway, that was just fun. But it isn't just thinking about lines though. Um, you know, and I saw that Sarah Fabricant had called in, so it's nice that I have a perfect example that she uh, sent me a few years ago. Um, what happened? when you don't carry through thinking about distance to derivative calculations like buffers. Well, you end up making examples like this, where we see the, the inaccurate distance that missiles can travel because, you know, someone had the idea that you can just draw some concentric circles and there you go. You know how far, you know how, you know the distance. You've got the buffer. I mean, every few years I get a new example about this. Um, just to show that it's not an isolated example, this is just last year. Um, to Merson had a really nice thread on Twitter regarding the errors that were made when people were trying to show context for the, the really horrific explosion in Beirut. Um, as she really nicely graphically demonstrated, you can't just draw a circular blast area and then move it to other places on a map and have it maintain the same meaning. Turns out that map projections just get in the way. So with these examples, you know, I would love a couple things. Um, one is to stop finding new examples of viral maps that use circular buffers on web and the other is to really have a better opportunity to explain why that weird non-circular buffer that, you know, that tools like Tableau calculate as part of a self-service analytics process, why it's right. Um, and it's, you know, because we do our analytics on ellipsoid. You don't need to worry about the calculations, but you, you just have to focus on asking the right questions of your data and exploring the visual result. But it means that you know, we need to help users periodically suspend their beliefs of how distance works on a planar map and accept how it works on the ellipsoid and is then projected onto Web Mercator. So, 
know, I've talked about a number of projection related challenges. So let's just take care of that conversation while we're at it um, as kind of a last note. Why don't we just use a different projection? Um, and it's because there isn't a single perfect map projection. And I wrote a bit about this recently in a paper on the unicorn of map projections. Um, if you're curious, I think, so I think that at least conceptually, everyone in the GI science domain understands the problem that there really isn't a single best projection, but it doesn't stop people from really wanting one or from falling into the trap of the latest and greatest new map projection going around on social media that you know, lays some claim to the ground of being the, you know, the quote unquote most accurate map projection ever. Um, every time I see one of those new projections come around, I mean, we start getting questions about why don't we support, why the evil Mercator, blah, 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 maps, 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 projection is bad, uh, you know, it just goes on. So the question then often goes to specific projections, either by name or, you know, my favorite, and I, I fielded a couple of these um, already this week, I want to have the rounded map. My boss says I need the rounded map. Get me that one. Or um, I've, I've also had uh, two of these were named specifically uh, in an email to me this week, somebody asking about whether we would support these, uh, and it wasn't equal Earth. So it was actually two of the weirder um, options. And so when you're talking about thematic mapping, you know, people see these maps and they think, this is great. I, I want this. It's the most accurate map ever because the news and Twitter said it was the most accurate map ever. Um, but with thematic mapping and the types of things we do and, you know, most kind of self-service type analytic tools, these are not appropriate projections, and they're actually really hard to work with because you would lose a lot of the functionality that makes self-service analytics tools nice. You know, being able to pan and zoom continuously, being able to have these well-designed base maps, being able to zoom in, zoom out, and have, you know, kind of reasonable levels of detail provided for context is really hard to do with some of these other options. Uh, you have five, and, you know, five minutes left. Sorry. I am almost yeah. done. Okay, so. Um, just bringing it back to our self-service analytics tools, I mean, you're typically going to find Web Mercator as the option um, because it's really impossible to automatically pick the right projection for every potential mapping project without knowing the data, the question, the location, the user intent, etc. Um, you know, and since we're going to provide a curated, symbolized, and labeled set of base map data, you know, it's really challenging to provide that for all of the variety of projections that are requested. And while you can use some trickery to do pretty much anything, um, you know, as you can see, you know, here's a polar projection that I made in Tableau. Um, you're probably still just going to be working with Web Mercator. Um, and since when I'm one of the few people that doesn't seem to, you know, completely hate Web Mercator, uh, I'll just throw out this reference in case you would like to have some reasons to love it. Um, I feel like I could write a dating profile for it. It's totally flawed, but I swear it's really nice and it has some good qualities deep down. Um, it's rectangular. The math is super easy. It's almost conformal. Um, highly recommend. So I'm happy, always happy to talk about Web Mercator if you want to talk offline. Um, anyway, so with that, I, I wanted to leave you with a few short notes on what I think our responsibilities are as GI scientists living in an era where mapping is easy, um, you know, where self-service analytics tools are plentiful, and you know, Twitter exists to torment us with the weird maps that people make. Uh, I think everybody with a spatial question should absolutely be empowered to ask and answer their own questions. but we have a responsibility to help people understand that spatial data is not what you expect it to be. Um, in the maps that we encounter, the maps we make ourselves, you'll be clear about these limitations, be open to criticism, help people decode your work to assess its quality, think carefully about how the tool you're using works. Um, is that just a straight line on the map? Is it the shortest path? Can I help people quality control? Should you use those hex bins? You know, I want people to be able to have access to all of these analytics tools that help them ask and answer questions, but I think in GI science, you know, we have this responsibility to be evangelists for um, spatial data, and we need to help people see and understand their maps and data so they can use spatial data effectively and to feel confident. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and stop. Thank you so much. Um, I've enjoyed having the opportunity to talk virtually with you today. Um, and while I've, you know, appreciated not having the long flight out to see you in person, uh, I, I am going to miss having the more informal 
conversations that often spring up after this sort of talk. So if anybody wants to chat further, um, you know, please feel free to reach out. Uh, my email, my social media contact is, in for, is uh, listed here. I'm happy to find a time to talk. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was great. Very engaging talk. And we also would like to have uh, some informal interactions maybe in the future. Great, so we have about 10 minutes for a q and I can see that there are already some questions. Please use the chat if you have questions uh, for Sarah. And, and I'm going to see if I can find the chat. So. Yeah, so it's in the bottom right. I will read the questions I, I have... out, but it might be easier also if you see them at the same time. So there's a question that I think is very relevant that probably a lot of us have been thinking about from Anita. Is Tableau considering moving to a globe display to deal with the issue of counterintuitive bin sizes due to Mercator? So no um, big push that I am aware of for a globe display, but I also am not a huge fan of the globe display. Like the, you know, like if you think about like a Google Earth type of thing where you just have this virtual globe that you can continuously spin because you know, we lose that key benefit of the flat map, which is that you can actually see everything um, together. And so I think, I think the virtual globes, you still have visual distortion that you have to deal with. And it becomes, you know, it becomes a complicated question. You know, personally, I would like to be able to switch rapidly between mm -hmm. a number of different projections because they each have different benefits in terms of visualizing and understanding patterns. But this is this is the problem of you need to, you know, in self-service analytics, you often have to limit the number of options to something that is going to work for the broadest spectrum, um, the best it, which is not the, you know, quote unquote, best. And I'm going to go ahead and unshare my my slides just so you guys can see me kind of gesticulating wildly <laughs> in case that's that's fascinating. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and you operate in a context where really the number of options have to be limited. And we're all used to very complex software tools where we can have hundreds of options. And obviously, you can switch between the globe to the any projection you like. But when you don't have that, when you have constraints, it's, it's very different. Great. And, so, and when you yeah. have the knowledge to choose the right projection. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I'm guessing most of the people who have called in here, if I said, you know, let's debate an equal area versus an equidistant for a particular map, we could probably have a good conversation about that. But if I say, hey, mom, and, you know, my mom, not a great connoisseur of maps, which map projection do you want? You know, she's going to say something to me like, I want that rounded one. Ooh, 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 give me the really cool one that looks like a butterfly. And that really may not be right. <laughs> Great. So the next question is from uh, David Unwin. Um, and uh, the issue I see here is the balance between geographic education that might address some of these map issues and the role of sophisticated tools that will prevent these mismatches of perception and analytics. What's your view? So this is something that we've we've talked about quite a bit. Um, Dan Streeby, I mentioned, you know, he's he's one of our principal engineers on the maps. He and I have, have conversations about this fairly regularly because there are some things like the hex bin examples where you know we actually can come up with some really you know concrete ways to say if you do something for you know say a geographic area larger than x the perceptual problems you know, will become significantly great you know it's like the just noticeable difference on the bin size and you know, how this is working visually is going to be it's, it's going to exceed a threshold of interest and we could you know, conceivably introduce that sort of thing, but then you have to figure out how do you explain it to someone. Um, you know, it's really a multi-pronged problem of when you start introducing, here is a hard and fast rule of you can't do this. You then have to make sure that people actually understand why they can't do it. Otherwise, it becomes a you know, really kind of an aggressive problem. Um, and while I would like everybody to be a super strong um have super strong knowledge of all of the the weirdness of spatial data when you're a technology company you just say we decided you can't do these 12 things that's that's an issue so there's some certain amount of you know we'll allow you to do it but we're also going to do our best to try and help you understand why sometimes you shouldn't do it and i spend a lot of time talking with people about that 
some kind of informed consent where you're like the science says that this is wrong <laughs> but do you really yeah, want Sarah, to do it, you have you know? sarah's check mark of approval i have allowed you to make hex bins and if you don't have my seal of approval yeah. your hex bins have been invalidated <laughs> Great. So the next question is from uh, uh, Sarah Fabricant. They say, is it about geographic education or geographic information education? Um, probably both, um, maybe more heavily the geographic information education, because I think, you know, there's the, the whole just general how we think about space, but then the how we turn that into information, how we how we simplify, how we go from our you know eyeball sensors into some kind of digital representation and that's the other one we're translating into the geographic information um, you know i am a huge proponent of both upping geographic education as a whole and helping people think critically about the world around us but also about this geographic information education and thinking about how it's the transformations that then you know make it a little bit more difficult so sarah it's about both of them thank you <laughs> Right, so um, actually a question I have, um, we, we have a lot of um, MSc students in the audience uh, in this series and I was wondering what recommendate, what suggestions and tips you have for uh, people who are, you know, imagine the situation you're finishing your MSc or your PhD in uh, geographic information science and the job market in academia is not great um, and how do you get into a job like yours in industry where you're, you, you combine really interesting problems with your um, scientific background? Uh, I mean, so, so my, my pathway in was as a research scientist, so it came from having this kind of an history in, in research. Um, but in general, I think that there are a lot of different pathways into into industry type careers, whether it's through really having more of an engineering side and being able to understand the technical details or really being in more of this evangelist type role. And you know, there are a lot of interesting positions, for instance, product management and being able to interface between the customers and the engineers and think about you know, how do you structure and shape a product to meet the needs. Um, there are, you know, there are definitely more customer-facing um, roles, and I know a number of people that are in this, you know, degrees in geography that really do a lot of kind of the mapping um, customer and sales type roles. If people want to talk about this specifically, you know, I'd be happy to talk about, you know, offline some of my experiences at Tableau and, and things that I know about other mapping type companies. It's probably bigger than than just having having a quick answer right now, but of course. definitely, if you want like skills to think about, definitely think about. How do you have enough technical knowledge to be able to put something together as an example and explain to someone really how it works in non-GI science language? Yeah, that's a really big challenge. And a lot of us as uh, um, teachers in, in GI science try to do that, particularly at the undergraduate level, but it's, it's really challenging. So we have about one minute left. And I was wondering, out of curiosity, what is the, the kind of spatial analysis that most customers request from from tableau like uh, the question I that i, I get the most is i need <clears throat> i need to know how many things are within the distance of x okay and now what happens if i want that x to be larger or smaller you know it's a okay. lot of dynamic proximity type of analysis um okay. and you know you could think about either network distance or straight line distance where are my customers relative to how far are the patients from the hospital how many liquor stores or near schools you know there's there's a lot of this just how how far away and how do things overlap and intersect does my line cross the polygon is my point inside the polygon that sort of thing very interesting no it's it's really good to know and i will tell my students about this so that they know that uh, they need to understand uh, distances and proximity <laughs> very well excellent so um time is up um uh, let's thank um, Sarah for uh, a great uh, contribution to the series and uh, let's hope to see you in person at some point at a, at a conference and um, please follow us on social media and on our website the next um, event is in two weeks uh, with Taylor Shelton so thank, thank you all for coming and uh, thanks Sarah for for your contribution
Thank you. Thank you all. Have a have a good rest of your day or evening.